back with Ruben and Michelle. We're going to cover rifle scopes. They're, <laughs> you thought there were a lot of options when it came to binoculars, rangefinders, uh, spotting scopes. You get into rifle scopes and there are a ton of different options. Because of, you know, not the quality of glass, which yes is part of it, but there's so many different things that Ruben will get into here on, you know, different sizes of the barrels and, you know, the different types of manufacturing reticles. There's uh, turrets. There's all kinds of different things. And uh, so I guess with that and looking at all these different things, I'm just going to turn it right over to Ruben and let him run with it and kind of explain all the different things to us here. Yeah, thanks, Art. Um, that's, that's not an easy task. Um, really what it boils down to is, um, to simplify, all of these optics are going to, when mounted to a firearm, they're going to uh, allow that firearm to be used in a certain specific purpose, for a specific purpose. Um, a lot of times, if you looked at a certain type of firearm, the type of optic you mount to it is really the determining factor of how it's going to be used. Uh, you've got some one to six power scopes over there that I would tell you are a fantastic choice for someone trying to get uh, the most versatility out of an AR style platform rifle. We've got a lot of scopes over here that if we were looking at uh, different types of hunting scopes for different types of hunters at different budgets, we're going to be able to cover a lot of options there. And then we've got some uh, scopes that are made for you know, doing some long range or uh, even extended long range types of shooting. And there's aspects and, and design features within all those different types of scopes um, that are going to lend themselves to a certain type of application or not, uh, ultimately. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of similarities to some of the other types of optics we've talked about today, which looking at that exit pupil, looking at um, the, the size of the body as being a limiting factor to the size of the lens elements that we can get into. Um, we can look at uh, even you know, magnification as, a, as something that's a limiting factor or a, an enabling factor. So if we were to start out kind of from a very common, common standpoint of like a very common scope that people would use, we would look at maybe a 3 to 9 or a 4 to 12 type of uh, variable power hunting scope. Uh, our Crossfire and Diamondback series of scopes are built on a one inch diameter main tube and um, very cost effective, very, very good quality for the price point. Um, but that's kind of just the start, right? Like we have all of these different types of optics and I can't stress enough that the optic is really the determining factor for what you're going to be using that gun for. And so uh, if we were to kind of... Uh, kind of take a stab at this from two different perspectives. If we looked at it from a hunting perspective, I've got scopes over here in really five different types of configurations with uh, you know different quality glass, different you know different tube diameters, different turret configurations, different eyepiece designs. Um, some of them have this funny looking knob on the side that we use to focus the image and some of them don't. And, if we were to look over there, we have stuff that would probably be described as more of a tactical style product. Um, maybe tactical or competition really would ultimately be what it's described at. But uh, I think if we, if we were to look at it first off from uh, kind of a tiered out perspective, very similar to how we talked about with binoculars, uh, we have our Crossfire, which is our entry level price point optic. We have our Diamondback series, which is uh, still a non-HD lens system, but we do have, that's our bang for your buck optic. I mean, Diamondback is really where a lot of people fall in in terms of price point, and then also it's, uh, it's giving a lot of people a lot of versatility. If we stepped into our Viper, that's kind of where we go into our, our HD type of lens uh, systems, and then moving up to our Razer HDs, the, the Light Hunter Razer is kind of the pinnacle of performance in terms of a hunting series scope. Um, so some of the some of the more obvious things that we can see uh, would be something like a tube diameter, um, objective lens diameter, very similar to binocular objective lens diameter. Um, but if we looked at those things being kind of differentiating factors of 
First thing being tube diameter. Uh, if we looked at two rifle scopes and we looked at uh, our Diamondback 4 to 12 and we looked at our Viper HS 2.5 to 10, one of the first things that we're going to notice is that they look very similar, but one of the differentiating factors is going to be this tube diameter. This being a 30 millimeter tube uh, on the Viper HS and on the Diamondback we have a one inch tube diameter. One inch is uh, approximately 25.4 uh, and so in terms of millimeters. Um, so a 30 millimeter tube is going to be a larger diameter than a one inch tube. Now I think there's some some things that people oftentimes think that going to a larger tube diameter can do for you. You probably have heard it, right? Uh, one of the number one things that we hear is that uh, a larger tube diameter is going to let in more light. And we already kind of determined what is going to let in more light, and that's uh, a larger objective, mag or objective diameter relative to your magnification, right? So if we ran uh, both scopes, let's just say a 3 to 9 by 40 and a 3 to 9 by 50, they can both have 1 inch tube diameters, but the 3 to 9 by 50 is going to be brighter. Uh, when we're running it at the same magnification. Uh, now obviously that 3 to 9 by 50, if you're running it at 9 power and you're running the 3 to 9 by 40 at 3 power, you know, it's, it's going to be one of those things where the, uh, even though the other scope has a smaller two, or, uh, objective diameter, when you're running it at a low power it's going to be brighter. Now what the actual thing that we get from uh, a larger tube is going to be a couple of things. Uh, if we kept the magnification the same, what we would see is an increased field of view, um, and typically we're going to see more travel in your turrets. So field of view we talked about with binoculars uh, also, but typically a larger tube is going to give us more, you know, more room in the engine compartment for uh, an, an optical system that allows for a wider field of view. Um, the other thing that, well, like I said before, is going to give you um, a little bit more adjustment in your turret system. Uh, the turret system, we're going to talk about in regards to a couple things here, but um, that's going to be your windage and elevation adjustments on the scope. So we like to call these turrets, that's the way they look, that's how they function. Um, but if we go to a larger tube diameter, we're going to get physically more clicks or more travel in that amount of, uh, when we're talking about how far up and down that reticle can travel. Now, that's not always important when we're talking about a traditional hunting scope where you kind of take it to the range a couple times a year and zero it and make sure that everything is good to go before deer opener. Um, where we see that travel being really important is in something like a scope that we're going to dial up and down all the time for taking longer shots. Uh, because ultimately we're re-zeroing our elevation every time we dial out a shot to longer distance, right? Um, so having more elevation adjustment uh, is going to give you the ability to dial that scope out to a further distance uh, relative to your caliber that you're shooting. One of the other things that having more elevation and windage travel is going to do is it's going to give, uh, it's going to add a level of forgiveness to um, if you're using, uh, you know, we'll, we'll use, we won't use any brand names, for example, but let's just say a mass-produced rifle that isn't um, being, like, uh, produced at an extremely high level of uh, precision. Uh, so what can happen is sometimes you can see a misalignment from your receiver to the barrel, and the bore is not always necessarily perfectly in line with the direction the receiver is pointing. So if every receiver was perfect, we wouldn't even have to have any adjustments because we would just mount a scope on it, and if the barrel was perfectly straight, the scope would already be sighted in. Now, I'm not talking about the straightness of the actual barrel. I'm talking about the direction the barrel is pointed relative to the receiver, right? Um, and so when we look at a scope that has more windage and elevation travel, that actually gives us the ability to correct for those misalignments in receiver to barrel, uh, you know, connection or mating. Uh, so with any optic, um, we've got a finite amount of travel. We can't dial it up to infinity or down to infinity, left or right, so on and so forth. And so because we have that finite amount of travel, we're working with that. Um, if we use up a bunch of that travel 
to zero. Let's just say you monoscope up and you have to use, you know, two or three full rotations of windage. Well, what happens is then we're not looking through the absolute center of the optical system. And when we're not looking through the center of the optical system, we're not getting the best optical quality. So resolution, clarity, low light performance, stuff like that. Uh, so if we have more available travel in the turret system, there's a much higher chance that we're going to be able to zero that optic closer to the center of its travel. Um, and so that's kind of getting really into the weeds on why travel is important, but it's, it's for a couple of things. It's for the ability to dial out uh, precision scope to longer distance. It's also the ability to zero scope closer to the center of its travel. And if we have more travel, the center is a larger portion as a percentage. I think one of the uh, what I the question I hear the most at the trade shows um, regarding tube size is that um, you know well doesn't the larger tube isn't that better for the guns that have more recoil and more kick? Are they strong? Are they better? Are they going to hold up better? Does that have anything to do with? So. It, what that. we can see, actually, um, we could see a little bit thicker of a tube diam uh, tube thickness, so the wall thickness of the tube, right? So um, typically we don't see that as a direct like correlation to going to a bigger tube or a direct result to going to a bigger tube, um, but you could you could hypothetically say that uh, a larger tube has it does have more bearing surface on the rings. Uh, so there's more surface contact, surface area, and that scope is going to be less likely to slip in the rings, right? So if we had something with heavy recoil, um, you're increasing the surface area that the rings are clamping to. And so typically I think that's something that people are referring to when they say that. You want a bigger tube diameter for the heavier recoiling rifles. I'm not sure that's always the, the, the path that is being followed in terms of why you want a bigger tube, but that's ultimately something that, yes, you are getting more surface area, more clamping area on the rings, which is going to have a reduced likelihood of that scope slipping under recoil. You know, and I guess some of the questions that I get a lot are, we get a lot of the crossword, you know, because in our Viper line, there's, you know, your HS, your HSLR, um, HST, and they all stand for different things yeah. as you get into things. And so they look at the turrets and they look at the parallax system. And they're like, well, what's parallax for? Why is it, why is it even here? Yeah. Can you make it so we don't need the parallax? Can, are, are there things that, a place you can turn it to? Um, so I guess if you could explain the parallax just a little bit and how that really works and then also with the turret, the biggest questions, and, and some of that might refer more to the long range stuff, um, but I do get it with some of the hunters. So will this go back to a zero stop? Yeah. Or will, you know, if I'm clicking this, um, other than the zero stop, can I get it custom built? So mm -hmm. for the exact caliber that I'm doing and things like that, uh, you know, other calibers for different rifles. Can we get that done? So if you can kind of touch on the turret system and the parallax just a little bit. Yeah, so um, in regards to the turret systems, uh, this is kind of like, like I said before, when you like drive onto the car lot, you already know specifically kind of what type of vehicle you're looking for. So when you look at rifle scopes, if you see something with an exposed turret system, you're probably going to be using that for dialing out to longer distance shooting, okay? So it's not like, do I buy this hunting scope without a big exposed turret or do I buy it with it? Like, they're purpose-built optics for very different purposes. You know, there might be crossover in the middle, but if you're looking for something with a turret system that's exposed versus a cap turret system, it's because you're going to be shooting longer distances or maybe shooting a cartridge out towards the further edge of its limits, right? So. To, to start out with turret systems, and we'll hit on parallax after that, um, you have multiple different types of turret systems. Um, we already mentioned the cap system, which is uh, you're going to zero that system in, you're zero that rifle, and probably not do a whole lot with that turret ever again. Um, you might check it before you go hunting, make sure that you've maintained zero, 
Uh, but ultimately, that's not something that you're adjusting a lot. It's kind of a set it and forget it. If we go to something with an exposed turret system like this, and ultimately, to not get too far into it, but if we're shooting at longer distances, what we're going to do is we're going to have some information about the bullet. We're going to have, hopefully, a program, like a ballistic program. You can get them, get them on an app like Hornady's Ford Off or Applied Ballistics. Um, there's multiple different types of shooting apps out there, ballistic apps. But we're going to enter in some general information. We're going to enter in our barrel twist, our caliber, the bullet weight, um, the ballistic coefficient, which is an efficiency me measure of how well that bullet flies through the air, um, and ultimately the, z the distance that we're zeroed at and the distance that we're shooting at. And that's going to give us uh, a number that we're going to dial our scope to or that we're going to hold on our reticle. Okay, so that's a, that's a crash course in long range shooting. But uh, a scope that has an exposed turret system is going to be one that we're able to reach up and dial that correction. If we're shooting a 308 at 500 yards and our ballistic calculator tells us to dial 12 and a half MOA of adjustment, we can do that right on that turret without having to take this cap off. We can always take the cap off of one of these scopes, but it's going to be a lot slower and it's not going to be nearly as um, intuitive as something that's designed for doing that, right? We don't, we, we don't put like street slicks on a Jeep, we put mud tires on a Jeep. Right. So uh, if we have a scope that has a turret system, it's because we're shooting at longer distances and we're correcting for that drop at distance. Now we would look at a system like our Viper HSLR, that's our hunting series long range. Uh, that's a hunting scope. It's uh, you know, a very capable target shooting scope too, but primarily made for hunting at long distance. If we stepped into our um, Viper PST Gen 2, which is the second scope in that line, that scope has a mechanical zero stop that we can go in and reset. Uh, once we've got our scope zeroed at a certain distance, we can reset that zero stop so that every time we're done shooting at extended distance, we can dial down to the distance that we're zeroed at without having to go back and check that, right? The turret will physically stop turning when we're back at our 100 yard zero or 200 yard, whatever distance we're zeroed at. A zero stop is going to be uh, a mechanical or uh, can be like a shim system, like in our uh, Gen 1 PSTs or HSLRs, but it's going to be a mechanical device that prevents you from dialing your turret down too far. So if you dial out to Let's say on that turret, you dial out to 28 MOA, and then you're thinking to yourself, did I dial 25 or 3, or like, do I go one full rotation and then 3 under, right? Um, a zero stop is going to stop that turret when you're back on your zero distance. Um, moving into like our Razor Generation 2 rifle scopes, that's actually a locking zero stop, which will have the ability to lock it. Um, if you pick that scope up and try and turn it right now, that turret will not turn unless you pull straight up on it to unlock it, at which point now you can adjust it. Then when you get your, your distance dialed in, you can relock it. Um, so there's, uh, there's complexity, there's added cost into something like that, but ultimately the end user that needs it is willing to pay for it. So that kind of explains zero stops a little bit. When we're talking about parallax, parallax is one of my favorite optical phenomena to talk about because parallax, uh, I think the best way to explain it is actually to, to physically uh, show an example of what it is. Um, when you have an optical system like a rifle scope, it's taking in an image. Now, image is being displayed inside of the rifle scope. So if you had a rifle scope like this, that image is coming in, there's a, a stop somewhere in here where there's a lens. That image is displayed there. Then you have your eyepiece. Your eyepiece is actually looking at that image. Now somewhere in between your eye and that image is going to be a reticle. That's your crosshairs, that's your aiming point. So what's happening is you have this focal distance in here that we need to adjust so that we can put the reticle and the image on the same plane. So the best way to explain that would be if here was our image and here is my reticle. Now, if you move your head back and forth, you can see that the reticle looks like it's dancing all around the target. What we're doing when we adjust this parallax focus is we're actually putting them on the same focal plane or on the same plane. 
And what happens now, when I move my head back and forth, the reticle doesn't look like it moves. So we can actually have a point of impact shift called a parallax shift or a parallax error that occurs when we don't have our parallax adjusted properly. And we also have scopes that have a fixed parallax. You'll see a lot of scopes don't actually have an adjustable parallax. That's because those scopes have a parallax that will typically be fixed at 100 yards for center fire cartridges. And at rim fire uh, cartridges, they're typically going to be um, corrected at 50 yards. So that being said, we could look at a scope like that Diamondback Tactical. And if we were to adjust that one, yep, you got it right, first guess was right. If we were to adjust the parallax on that scope, we could actually shoot a target as close as 10 yards without having to worry about parallax error. So parallax um, is something that you can have a guy who says the rifle is shooting terribly, shooting a big group like that at 200 yards, and we can go and look, and if he doesn't have his parallax adjusted properly, he could be experiencing a shift that's only due to parallax not being set properly. Is there a way to set that so yeah. that they don't have to worry about it? So it goes back, and we'll, this is a great place to interject uh, rifle eyepiece focus or diopter focus on a rifle scope. Uh, reticle focus, some people will call it, we'll call it, we'll call it a diopter. So your eyepiece here uh, on a lot of rifle scopes is going to rotate. Now, uh, same concept as with a binocular, we're setting this for our eye. It's going to be different for you as it is for you as it is for me. Um, so when we set this diopter adjustment or eyepiece focus, reticle focus, whatever we want to say, we're setting it for a particular person's eye. The best way that we can do this is we can look up at a white ceiling or a blue sky with you know no clouds in it, and we would adjust this until that reticle, not the, not the image, the reticle or the crosshair looks perfectly in focus to our eye. And your eye is tricky. Your eye is going to tell you that it looks in focus, so what you'll do is you'll look away every couple seconds while you're doing this process. You'll look away and look back through the optic, and you'll see, okay, it looks a little bit better. I'm going to adjust it. Then I'm going to look away again. My eye is going to focus on something, you know, other than the radical. And then you look back through it again and it's blurry. You just keep fine-tuning that until you can look at something, let's say, 50 yards away. Your eyes aren't necessarily uh, straining. And then you look back through and the reticle is clear. Okay, now this is a long segue to setting your parallax focus. Because if you don't have your diopter set properly on your rifle scope, the parallax is not going to be adjustable properly either. So, the best way to do this is to um, set your diopter, your eyepiece focus, and then go to your parallax. You'll pick a target, and you're going to have to try and keep your rifle very steady. You're going to look through it, but if you have sandbag or a shooting bag that you can prop the rifle up with, or a bipod, um, aim that rifle at the target, um, and adjust the parallax until you can move your head back and forth behind the optic, and the reticle does not appear to be dancing. So you'll see it. As you adjust, it'll dance less and less until it becomes perfectly, um, uh, it'll be in focus and it'll also um, won't be moving. So that's how you adjust parallax. And you can't do it in scopes that don't have an adjustable parallax. But typically, we would use these on uh, a rifle that's dedicated, maybe not necessarily for target shooting, something that would be... Uh, uh, I should I should explain also that parallax error within reason isn't necessarily going to be drastically uh, like it's not going to be drastic amounts. It could be a couple of inches. So if we thought you know about like a maybe a, a hunting scope, we're looking at the vital zone of the animal that we're hunting um, and saying that even if the reticle moved around an inch within that 10 inch vital zone, that's not really that big of a deal typically. Um, generally speaking, again, um, you would want to select the right optic for what you're doing, but if we were trying to punch holes in paper and put every bullet in the same hole, that's where parallax becomes very, very um, helpful. It also becomes very helpful when we're shooting at extended distances because what it's going to do is also, it's also going to tell your eye that the image is more in focus, just like with cameras where you have a camera, an image focus on a camera. So, I guess another question 
that we have, and then we'll kind of get into reticles here, is, you know, I've had people come up to the shows and they say, yeah, I, I've done this and it, I shoot it, I can zero it in, I come back later, shoot it, and it's not. Then they look at you and say, so are your scopes, are they torque specific when you try to torque sure. that, you know? Uh, so when I'm putting the rings on, like, well, what did you torque it to? Well, we just take it and crank it down until it's super tight. Yeah. And so I guess each one does, is every scope different in a torque specific or are they the same or? So there are scopes that can handle more torque and there are scopes that can handle less torque. Um, the wall thickness and the placement of internal components is going to change within every rifle scope, right? So if we were to look at a razor, it might be able to handle a little bit more, but that being said, uh, 15 to 18 inch pounds is more than enough to hold any rifle scope <coughs> with quality rings on any rifle. So we don't need to go over 18 inch pounds. Uh, and how we're determining that is by the use of a torque limiting wrench or a torque screwdriver. Um, Vortex has one, Wheeler Fat Wrench. You know, there's all these different wrenches out there that uh, you could use, but as long as it's a torque limiting screwdriver or wrench, you could use that to determine and properly set torque on your rings. So it is actually pretty important uh, because what's happening inside of a scope tube is not only do you have all of these glass elements, which really don't want to tighten anything too tight on them. Uh, it's made out of glass. Um, very durable, but still, nonetheless, we don't want to put more pressure than we should. The, uh, the scope has what's called an erector system in it. And so what's happening when you take a rifle scope and you dial both windage and elevation or vice versa, what's happening is there's, there's this kind of ball and socket system. So you have uh, a gimbal inside here and when you are adjusting your magnification or uh, when you're adjusting your elevation and windage uh, what's happening is think of it a lot like your your shoulder you have this ball and socket and when you adjust up you're letting that erector system move up which is shifting the reticle over the image when you dial down you're pushing that reticle down same thing happens with windage you're adjusting side to side now there's a spring um, an erector spring in here that's pushing on that. It's creating a bias force on the erector assembly. When you dial up and down, um, when you dial this way, counterclockwise, you're actually letting that spring push out. When you dial up, you're letting the spring push up. And what happens is when we get too much uh, pressure uh, on the torque setting specifically, is it's pinching this rear uh, assembly here which is like if you have ever had issues with your shoulder, like an impingement, you're not able to move it freely, okay? The other thing that you can have happen is if you put too much torque on your front ring uh, and you ha have a parallax adjustment, something like this, when you adjust this parallax setting, there's actually a, a lens cell that's moving in here. And if you have too much pressure on that front ring, now you can't get your parallax set properly because internally it's being bound up. Same thing happens back here. When you put too much pressure on this rear ring and you adjust your elevation and windage, you'll see it jump around because it's actually being crunched back here. So it's pivoting back here. And so when this is too tight, now your, your erector assembly is not being able to move up and down and left to right freely. So that's kind of, again, a long explanation of how that works. But yeah, it is really important to use the proper torque setting and uh, as important as it is to use the proper torque setting, it's important to use high quality mounts and rings. Cool. So let's kind of jump into, you know, your longer range. And I guess when we're talking about longer range, you know, you look at this and you touched on it a little bit already on, you know, some of the turrets and some of the different things. I see some of these have lighted reticles in them. Yep. So when we get into the lighted reticles, let's talk about the different reticles from the hunting end all the way to the long range, um, you know, first focal plane compared to a standard focal sure. plane. And, and just kind of touch on those and uh, run with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if we were looking at um, a traditional hunting scope, we'll talk about, we'll start very elementary here. Uh, a crosshair reticle, 
you know, or a, a V-plex, something where it's got thicker outside stadia, uh, and then a, a cross in the center where that's where your aiming point is. That's a very simple reticle. It's giving you one aiming point, though. It's where those two hairs cross, right? Uh, hence the term. Um, when we look at something that can become more complex, you know, we have our dead hold BDC reticle. That's a ballistic drop compensation, uh, and that's what that BDC stands for. Uh, what that's doing is it's taking an, an average of ballistics curve, an average ballistics curve of very popular hunting cartridges, and it's kind of predetermining some holds for different distances. Our dead hold BDC works extremely well with. Uh, real traditional hunting cartridges like a 270 Winchester, um, 30-06, 308, stuff like that. Uh, and what you would do is you would zero your, your rifle scope at 100 yards and it's giving you holds for two, three, and 400 yards or two, three, four, and 500 yards. Um, if you were to look at uh, something that's maybe a more modern, more efficient cartridge like a 6.5 Creedmoor, um, you know, 300 Win Mag, something where you're shooting higher velocity and a bullet that's maybe a little bit more efficient, um, you would zero that system at 200 yards, and now you have holds out to 600. Now, um, in regards to reticles, there's there's a there's a ton of different reticles out there, right? Those are two very simple reticles. One being the the VPlex that only gives you very simple information. It's a it's a zero distance. That's where you're zeroed at. The BDC is giving you additional information in that reticle. Not too technical, but it's to the point where uh, a hunter, whether it be a Midwest hunter or a Western hunter, you have now information in that scope that's giving you um, accurate holds for a longer distance shooting. Um, kind of like we mentioned before with some of the more long range orientated scopes, you have like um, stuff with exposed turrets or um, you mentioned specifically reticles that are in different focal planes, right? So we have a traditional hunting scope, uh, probably probably like 70 to 80% of scopes out there are what we would call a second focal plane rifle scope. It's because the reticle is in the second focal plane of the scope. Scopes have multiple focal planes. Uh, if we were to look at something like uh, a competition or tactical scope, like the three that you have in front of you there, those are all uh, scopes that have the reticle placed the reticle is a physical thing. It's not, you know, it's you, know, you put some powder in the scope and shake it up. It's it's a it's etched on glass or it's made out of wire. So um, the reticle in a scope being placed in a first focal plane of the scope or front focal plane um, allows you to have a reticle that is consistent at all magnifications, so that you could use that reticle for different information at any magnification. Now, probably thinking, well, what about second focal plane scopes? Well, if a second focal plane scope has multiple different types of information in it, like our BDC reticle, a second focal plane scope can only have those hold marks for different distances accurate at a specific magnification. And usually that's the highest magnification. The thought process there is that if you're shooting longer distances and you need that information to uh, hold for shots at different distances, then you're going to also need the magnification to see the target you're shooting. That's why usually second focal plane scopes, the reticle is calibrated at the highest power. Um, don't be worried about that because it says that in the uh, user manual of every scope we make, what, uh, what power the reticle is calibrated at. First focal plane scopes allow us to use that reticle at any magnification. And um, the reason for that and the attractiveness of that concept is that you don't have to look down at your magnification when you want to make a hold for a certain distance shot, right? So that's what's very attractive about first focal plane. They're also really, really popular in uh, the competition and tactical worlds, but they're becoming more and more popular in the hunting world where we might have to take a shot and we don't have a ton of time to you know, you have a few things that you have to do when you're gonna make a long shot. You gotta range your target. You have to find out um, how far to hold over or dial on your sit turret. The last thing that you wanna have to do then is look at your scope. What magnification am I at? Like I have to, you know, you're adding all these things that you have to do before you can make an accurate shot. Having a first focal plane scope allows you to do that, but 
takes away one of those steps. So it's a time saver. It's also makes you a better, uh, better long range shooter. Uh, illuminated reticles to kind of touch on that a little bit. You have different ways to make reticles, like we said. They can be wire, they can be glass, they can be etched in glass. Um, if there's a scope that has an illumination function to it, typically that's a glass etched reticle. And that's taking a, a lens or a lens element within the scope and etching a pattern on it of whatever the reticle you want, what you want the reticle to look like. And then you're filling that etching in the glass it's microscopic, it's very tiny, you can't really see it with the naked eye, but um, you're filling that, those etched surfaces, think of little craters in the glass, um, little valleys, you're filling those with a reflective type of material. You can then put a small LED light in, which is powered by a 2032 battery, and when you turn that uh, illumination on, you're seeing a reflection of that LED uh, from that reflective filling in that red reticle. So that's kind of how that works. Yeah, so it's not just kind of throwing together and, you know, it's, this is the way this yep. is going to work. So, and as you said, I mean, there's so many, we could sit here and talk about reticles because, you know, when you look on the website, things, there's, there's so many different ones out there. Um, but I guess instead of really touching, because we could be here all day talking about different reticles and what they really mean as far as you know windage and elevation sure. and and different things i guess the biggest thing to touch on or one of the bigger questions we have is what's the difference between mrad and moa okay and that you know a lot of them will probably never go either way they want a hunting scope but they see that when they're looking through and they say well what's the big difference here yeah i don't know I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, when you have uh, you have two different systems of angular measurement. When we're talking about shooting, and uh, we'll kind of use long range shooting as an example, but when we're talking about compensating for a bullet's drop or the trajectory differences at different distances, like I said before, we'll typically use like a software program or an app to determine how much drop we have at different distances. And so, what we need to do is we need to measure that. Well, it's not a linear measurement, it's actually an angular measurement, because we're measuring from this point to another point, and we're actually measuring kind of that arc, and so we need to measure how far, as an angle, we need to uh, point the barrel up to compensate for that. So because of that, we're actually using an angular system of measurement, or one angular system of measurement. The first one that we're going to kind of cover quickly is the most popular one, that's what uh, most rifle scopes today, especially in the hunting world, are, is their minute of angle system. So the, the minute of angle system is, without getting too far into detail, uh, it's a fractional system. So we're looking at typically at a quarter or eighth uh, increments to that. Um, so when you look at a scope and it says, on the turret system, it'll say one click equals one quarter MOA at 100 yards, or some of them say one quarter inch at 100 yards. What that's really referring to is that uh, a quarter MOA adjustment is uh, very easy to measure because one MOA at 100 yards is roughly 1.047 inches, so roughly an inch, we'll just say that. So if we break that down, an MOA broken into four pieces at 100 yards is going to be each click is a quarter of an inch. That's traditionally what most rifle scopes that are designed for hunting are made for. Even if you don't know it, even if you look at the scope and it says one click equals one quarter inch at 100 yards, it's probably an MOA based scope. Minute of angle, okay? The next system is a mill radian system. Now, without getting too far into that, the mill radian system is a decimal based system. So it's a base 10 system. Um, it's not a metric system, it's a base 10 system. So for anybody out there that says, I don't shoot mills because I don't use the metric system. That's, um, it's not lazy, it's just not true. Um, the mill system or MRAD is, um, a base 10 system, so we're, we're now, instead of measuring quarter MOA, we're talking about one-tenth of a mil. So if we looked at 
one MOA being roughly one inch at 100 yards, one mil, or mil radian, or MRAD, um, we'll say mil, at 100 yards is 3.6 inches. So if you looked at those two systems, um, a mil is 3.6 times larger as a linear measurement at 100 yards than an, than an MOA is. But because we're separating a mil into 10 parts and we're separating an MOA only into four parts, typically the mil system you're going to see one click on a scope, if it was a 10th, um, would be about 0.36, 3.6 divided by 10, versus uh, an MOA being 0.25, a quarter MOA. So they're not all that different. What the best thing that I can explain it would be um, if you buy a mill scope, you're going to tell your scope, uh, your, your uh, ballistic app that your scope is a mill scope. And uh, if you buy an MOA scope, you're also going to tell your app that it's an MOA scope. And so what it boils down to is, and I always like to use this analogy because it works for me, if um, you're driving down the road, you don't need to convert miles per hour into feet per second into inches per minute. Like, you don't need to do that. Your speedometer says miles per hour. So you match that with what the road sign says. So just like when I'm on my app and I'm looking at, um, you know, and, and I guess the best, the way, the reason I explain that is uh, because you'll see a lot of times people will see a target and they'll range it and then they'll get their, um, we'll call it dope, their data on previous engagement. And then they'll try and figure out how many inches of drop 10 MOA is. It doesn't matter. Your scope says MOA right here. And your ballistic data program, your app, says MOA in there. So we don't, inches don't matter anymore. We're talking in angular measurement. And so it doesn't matter to me if the road signs are in kilometers per hour, as long as my speedometer is in kilometers per hour. So there's kind of this, um, there's a big movement within the competition and tactical worlds right now that uh, are kind of switching over to mil radians, uh, MRAD. It's a faster system of measurement. It's just like if there's a stop sign 100 yards away and I gave you uh, a ruler that was one foot long and I gave you a yardstick that was 36 inches long, you would be done significantly faster than he was because he's going to have to measure three times for every time you measure once. Mill radian system is faster. So if we were talking about competition or tactical where speed and time are very important, they're very precious, the MRAD system to me is more effective. It's also one of those things where if you've been shooting using MOA system of measurement for 40 years, don't switch. It's not that much better. Okay. So when we're looking at MOA versus mil, they're both systems of angular measurement. That's really the, the most important part is to know that they're angular and not linear systems of measurement. Um, and that as long as your scope matches what your ballistic app is, and it's literally a click of a button, you can switch your app to MOA to mil. As long as you're shooting consistent with that, then it doesn't matter what system you're using. You just need to pick one and use that. Uh, the other thing is, I will say this, uh, if you go to the range with a bunch of people that use MOA scopes, don't buy a mil scope. Buy what they're using because it's not, it's such a small benefit to go to mil radians in the same way, vice versa. If you go uh, and everybody that you shoot with shoots mills, then buy a mill scope because that's going to be uh, a much easier learning curve if you're using the same equipment that all the knowledgeable people are using. So, that's it, language. Yeah, exactly, right? If we're, uh, it does not matter as long as the speedometer matches the road signs, that's all I care about. Well, I guess, you know, that covers a ton of stuff here and a lot of information. Um, just one of the last, I guess, that I have when I'm looking at, you know, your long range is when we get into the Diamondback and the Viper Tacticals, they're on our 30 millimeter. Yep. Base. We get into the Razor, we go to a 34. Yep. That, as explained earlier, is just to give us more 
you know, distance or more turret room. Yep. Elevation, windage. So, is am I correct in saying that for the ultimate long range, for guys that shoot a lot of long distance, they're looking more for that thirty four. Yeah, typically what we would see is we would see a, a heavy trend towards a 34 millimeter scope tube if they're doing a lot of dialing on that turret, right? Because there's more adjustment internally on a 34 than there is on a 30 and even more so than there is on a one. Uh, but the 34 millimeter tube also just has much more room internally for the types of lens elements that we're using in a long range precision scope. Now keep in mind, this is a three to nine by 40 with a one inch tube. That's a four and a half to 27. So the magnification range uh, is much higher or, or the, the, uh, the top end magnification is much higher than this is, okay? So if we were thinking about the types of lenses and the optical design of the whole package, that's gonna require more space. And so a 34 mil tube is just a bigger engine compartment. The other thing too that with a lot of scopes, like if we were to look at a Diamondback Tactical first focal plane with a 30 millimeter tube, um, the scope is very durable in and of itself. Uh, it's not a duty purpose built optic. If we looked at a Razor Gen 2, that optic is absolutely made to be bomb proof. And so there are um, some durability features built into that scope that make it physically larger. So it's not just going to always be one thing, right? There's there's going to be multiple op, uh, multiple things that make a scope bigger, heavier, you know, shorter, lighter, um, illumination, you know, the parallax adjustment, the locking turret system instead of having, you know, uh, a mechanical zero stop or a, a locking mechanical zero stop versus just a zero stop, right? So there's a bunch of stuff that really goes into why a scope is the size that it is or the weight that it is. Um, and a lot of times that, you know, means increased durability, means increased performance at long distance. Um, we, uh, we did some shooting uh, at a long range event a couple weeks ago, and we wanted to see how um, accurate our tracking was on one of our Razor Generation 2 scopes. And so we did what's called a tall target test, where we take a target that's about eight feet tall, and we dial that elevation starting at the very bottom all the way to the top. And we found that there was a 0.003% error within the dialing. Now, that's a pretty small error, right? So to put that into perspective, we were looking at, um, that's a 0.03, not 003. 0.03% uh, error meant that with the cartridge that we were shooting that day, that at 1,300 yards, that error only equated, equated to one half of a click in the scope's turret travel. So... There's a lot of things that go into making a scope be accurate for dialing at long distance, um, and some of those things can take up more physical space in the tube. But that's kind of what goes into a rifle scope. So that'd probably look pretty good on my Creedmoor. I, I'm thinking so. But I got it all. <laughs> yeah. I think you know a guy. <laughs> so, um, I think, I mean, that's just a ton of information that... Uh, my brain is full. Yeah. My brain is yeah, full. That, um, you've covered, you know, you talked about all the funny looking knobs you mentioned sure. earlier. And you talked a lot about the reticles and different options there. Um, we're also going to share some, you know, links. There's some other helpful yep. tools um, that can help answer some other questions. Um, we can show you the other reticle options as well. Yeah, um, there's a ton of that, reticle options yep. within our product line, within other companies' product lines. You, you know, it's, again, we keep going back to that, that specific purpose just, you, you need to know, you know, a rifle scope isn't a good thing to walk into a store and say, hey, talk me into something, right? You need to go in knowing what you want to use it for. Um, you should be knowing kind of what kind of gun you want to put it on or crossbow or whatever you're using. Um, and you should be able to, at the end of that conversation with a sales associate or if you call uh, Vortex Optics here or if they talk to you at a show, you should be able to, at the end of that conversation, if you went in with knowing what you need it for, you should be able to get exactly what you need and get it mounted up and get out on the range. Well, I think that's a wrap I, for today. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much for absolutely. your time today and sharing all of your knowledge and expertise with us. We really yeah. appreciate it. 
and uh, hopefully all of these tips and the information that Ruben shared with us can help you own the season.